Well, we're glad you got here. Yes, Okay, here we go. Let's open with prayer. Mm -hmm. Lord, we thank you for this new day, and we thank you for this day that we call Christmas Eve. And we thank you for the incarnation and the coming of Jesus Christ and, and how that changed human history. And Lord, whether, whether someone believes or doesn't believe that Jesus is the Son of God or doesn't believe in God, um, the, the fact that Jesus Christ changed the history of this world more than any other single human being is, is, is I think, undeniable. And so, Lord, we, we ask that the, the reading we do this morning and the study that we do and the conversation we have might be pleasing in your sight, and it might be edifying to those who believe in you, and it might um, encourage and, and, and just, just bless um, the world, um, bless the whole world, as, as was promised in Abraham's promise. So help us, Lord, to... To speak well and to think well and to talk well and give us your peace. So we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I thought, yeah, we would just start reading in the Gospels and we'll start with Matthew. And if we go all the way through Matthew, which I doubt we will, given our track record. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we'll probably not get beyond Matthew, but that's okay. Are you trying to say you like your father? <laughs> I, 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 my track record in this class is abundantly clear. We love the history lesson. Oh, oh good. Yes. Yeah, actually, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> when you understand the history, you understand the Bible. Because there was so much I didn't understand. But Me too. Right. It's the history that kept me here. <laughs> Okay. But the people are good. That's right. That's right. I mean, that's you, you got to start someplace. But that's that's the funny thing with the church that you, you know, you might come because you like something of the teaching or the music or something like that. But it's the relationships that yeah. keep you there. So Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and as as Carol said, and I, you know, Carol's the one that turned me on to listening to the Bible through Bible Gateway. I didn't even know that. I love it. And I, I, I do it often. If I've got, you know, if I'm working on a sermon, I usually start, you know, working on my sermon early in the week, and I like to work on it bit by bit throughout the week. I usually, one thing, first things I do is listen to it instead of read it. Because I, I catch different things listening than I do reading. And so I'll listen to it, and then I'll be like, oh, okay. And then I'll listen to it a few times. And it's really easy to listen to it a few times. You can hear it in the car. You can hear it while you're doing dishes. Um, now, what channel is it? Bible Gateway is BibleGateway.com. It's on the computer. And you have to go in and you have to, they have several different options. I chose the NIV dramatization. Oh, I didn't do the dramatization. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, okay. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. And um, it, it, they have different people who do different parts, yeah. you know? Uh, they have the narrator, who narrates all this genealogy, but when you get to Matthew 17, it sums it up very nicely for you. Oh, okay. You know? yeah. Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Verse Matthew 1, 1, 17. 1, 17. I was going to say, boy, that's a lot of reading to get to chapter 17. No, <laughs> no, no. It's, First, uh, chapter 1, verse 17, and I said, oh, there goes the number 7 again. <laughs> <laughs> so, Matthew starts out with a genealogy. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, let's pause there. Why would Matthew, well, and then we can get into a little bit about the different, the, the different Gospels. What, what's Matthew saying right there in his first verse? What's his emphasis? That's right. But why on earth would you start? I mean, today, if you read a contemporary biography, I think the last thing anyone would start with would be a chapter like this. 
But he had to show the significance of Jesus' bloodline. Ah, uh, why? Because Abraham was the father of all. And then you get to King David, who was supposedly the wisest. And then came Solomon. And these were all part of Joseph, Jesus' father. Well, Judah. Judah. So Abraham is the father of nations and the father of Israel. Uh, and so Abraham's a patriarch. Right. And then David is this king. Go ahead, Lil. No, I was going to say, um, with Matthew, starting out with Matthew, uh, that's the beginning of fulfilling what the Old Testament had already talked about that was going to be coming. So now we, we're starting to you know, get the picture of what you're talking about, mm -hmm. and how it's here. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we're now going back and, and repeating who, who Abraham and this and that, but it's fulfilling all the way through to Revelation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about Revelation for years. <laughs> <laughs> 75 weeks in the book of Revelation. Oh, wow. It was great, though. It was great. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I wasn't here. And, and, and you know who got us going in Revelation? Anyone remember? Pardon? Anybody remember who got us going in the book of Revelation? H.J. Remember H.J.? Yeah. H.J. H.J. says, so we're talking about what book to do next. And H.J. said, oh, we don't want to do Revelation. <laughs> I said, well, why not? And I personally... I, I grew so much through that book, that study, that for me, it's now one of my favorite books in the Bible. And before, like H.J., I was scared of it because it's full of all this crazy stuff. And you wonder, what's this about? And I feel the same way about Ezekiel. Before we started Ezekiel, I was like, oh, Ezekiel, I, I don't know if we can handle Ezekiel. You're welcome. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> but now I, 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 I think the book of Ezekiel is amazing. So, you know, this, we're all beginners. We're all beginners in this. We really are. So, no, you're exactly right, Lil. Um, Matthew, and Matthew writes, Matthew's gospel, just by the way he puts it together, seems mostly targeted to the Jews, to Jewish Christians, you know, early Jewish Christians. And, and so the emphasis in Matthew is often that Jesus is the heir of the Jewish story. And so he connects him right there to, you know, David, the great king, and Abraham, the great father, and, and starts right there. Father was the, uh, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Now notice he, men he mentions Judah because, now Judah is very interesting because Judah started out to be a pretty bad man. And, and one, of the, one of the things about the patriarchs, too, is that the, you know, if you read Hebrews 11 about the heroes of the faith, the patriarchs are there. And, and they're rightly there because they are heroes. But our idea of a hero is often that heroes always did the right thing. But if you read the book of Genesis, you find that these heroes, you know, did, often did the wrong thing. And sometimes did terrible things. And Judah's a great example of that. And anybody, well, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. And this is one of the interesting things about Matthew's genealogy. Yeah. That Matthew's genealogy includes some women. And these are rather interesting women. Because we might think Abraham and Sarah. Or Isaac and Rebekah. Or Jacob and Rachel and Leah. But Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah are not mentioned, and he mentions Tamar. And this points to the critical element of the story of Judah. Now, when you read the book of Genesis, you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. That's kind of how the book of, of Genesis goes. But right in the middle of that is the story of Judah. And Judah is the one who obviously becomes the father of the, the tribe of Judah, which is the southern kingdom, which is the home of Ezekiel that we've been going through. But, but Judah, um, so, so here's, here's a little bit of the story of Joseph. So 
Okay, well, let's see. So you got to back up because all these stories are, are interconnected. So Isaac, so Abraham is barren with Sarah. And really the story of Abraham in Genesis is about how Abraham is only kind of believing God. What promise did God give Abraham that Abraham really latched onto? His wife was going to have a baby at the old age. That's right. And his wife was going to have a son. And Abraham's latching onto this. But he, and this is, this is so indicative of what we do as Christians. God gives us a promise and we, we latch on to the promise, but at the same time, we're not really believing that God will fulfill the promise. So we try to fulfill it ourselves. It's really what the story of Abraham is about. So Abraham keeps trying to fulfill the promise himself. And at one point, Sarah cooks up a scheme. What's, what's Sarah's scheme to get a baby? Have her That's right. Have Hagar have the child. And this is very common in the ancient world. People often had children through their slaves. And unlike American slavery, where the children of the master and the slave woman was what? Was a slave. In the ancient world, the children of the master and the slave woman was an heir. So that's a, that's a critical difference between American slavery and ancient slavery. Anyway... So, so Abraham um, sleeps with, with Hagar and has Ishmael. And, well, how'd that go? Not, not so good. Not so good. Very quickly, Hagar, now Hagar is able to produce an heir. Mm -hmm. What happens to Hagar's status? Oh. And what kind of things does she start talking to Sarah? Stuff. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so Sarah then goes to Abraham and says, get rid of this woman and her stupid son. Now Abraham has a problem. And, and Sarah runs away. And then the angel, you know, brings Sarah back. Hagar, Hagar sorry. That's right. Hagar, thank you, Maury. <laughs> thank you, Maury. You know, it's funny in these YouTubes because I speak all the time. When I'm speaking to YouTube, people leave it in the comment section. <laughs> They what? They leave the, they note it in the comment section. You said this, it should have been that. It's like, oh, so oh. true. So, um, so, oh, where was I? Okay. Um, so right away, so then Abraham and Sarah have Isaac, and then Sarah's like, I really want Ishmael gone, because I don't want him threatening Isaac. Because what happens when, <laughs> oh, let me ask you this question. What happens when someone dies and there's a lot of money and there's siblings? I'm the oldest, I'm yet. That's right. That's exactly what Ishmael would have claimed. I'm the oldest, I'm the heir. And so this time, Abraham really does send off uh, Hagar and Ishmael. And God says to Abraham, I'll make him a great nation too. But Isaac is the heir. This gets into the whole thing about primogeniture in the book of Genesis, which I won't go into now. But what this also sets up is a whole bunch of dysfunctional families in the book of Genesis. Yeah. Abram and Sarah have a very dysfunctional family. Isaac and Rebecca. Oh, you had a current, current, oh. Isaac and Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca have twin sons. And their twin sons are Esau and Jacob. Now, if you ask a good parent, which of your children do you love more? What does the good parent say? I love them all equally as well. I love them all the same. Now, is that usually true? Mm, yes, but in, yeah. but in different ways. That's right. Go ahead, Barbara. Love could be the same, but your parenting is definitely different. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so here in the here in the story of um, Jacob of Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Esau, Jacob, Isaac and Rebecca aren't great parents because they both play favorites, and this comes to produce bitter fruit. Jacob likes Esau, Rebecca likes Isaac, and and so this sets up this whole dynamic of buying the birthright and. And because Jacob is a conniver, in, in a sense, in a sense, Ishmael gets sent away so that Ishmael wouldn't do what Jacob did. Think about that sometime. Mm -hmm. And so 
Esau wants to kill Jacob. Jacob has to flee for his life. He goes and flees to Uncle Laban. And boy, Laban's got a few things to teach Jacob. And so the whole switch of, Ray, of Leah and Rachel and that whole mess. So these families are, these families are a mess. And, and then you get to Jacob as a father. And um, so his two wives, so in, in a sense, what, what you find in the book of Genesis is that the book of Genesis is, it, one way to look at it would be everything you could do wrong with your family is in the book of Jacob, in the book of Genesis. The first two sons in the book, what happens to them? One kills the other. One kills the other. Um, you know, all the different ways you could screw up a kid and mess up a family, they're all in the book of Genesis. And so Jacob, you would think, Jacob would say, you know what, this whole business about dad and mom and favoritism, that was a mess. I should, I should look at my kids and say, I love you all the same. In fact, you should have looked at your wives and said, I love you all the same. But Uncle Laban didn't let that happen. So, so Leah, he didn't like so much. And Rachel, he loved. So then what happens is Leah is having all these sons. So her status rises. And Rachel is barren. So her status diminishes. And that then sets angst between these two women. But guess what? What's the relationship between these two women? They're sisters. So you've got sisters now who have enmity, the enmity between them and are fighting. And so finally, you know, so then the maidservants get involved and they're having sons. And then finally, when Jacob is older, Rachel has a son and his name is Joseph. And Judah, or, or Israel, or Jacob, what then does Jacob do now with the, the first son of his favorite wife? It treats the kid differently than all the rest. Treats the kid differently than all the rest. Gives him a coat of many colors. Many colors. Many colors. Well, how's this going to go over with the rest of the sons who are all older and bigger and stronger? So they all hate him, plus the fact that Joseph comes around and Joseph is having these dreams. And he starts telling these dreams to his brothers, and these aren't the kind of dreams where Joseph says, I have this dream and I love my brothers and they're all such wonderful men. No, he has these dreams of, I have this dream where all my brothers were bowing down to me and serving me. <laughs> Talk about a recipe. So, so the brothers get together and they say, we can't stand this kid, let's kill him. Yeah, hey, Cain and Abel killed. You know, hey, we've got a history, got a history in this family of Adam of killing our brothers and sisters. So, so here, let's kill him. And Judah's the one with the bright idea that says, the thing about murder is there's no money in it. <laughs> so it's one thing to be a murderer. It's a Judah's not only ready to be a murderer, he's too greedy for that. <laughs> so there's no money in killing him. I've got an idea. Let's sell him into slavery. So what do they do? They sell him into slavery to who? Their cousins, the Ishmaelites. And Joseph gets hauled off to Egypt. So then the, so then the story, one of the cool things about Lord of the Rings, if you like Lord of the Rings, is the story splits up. Well, the, Genesis does this too. So the story splits up. So the majority story kind of goes with Joseph to Egypt, but the minority story kind of stays with Jacob. And so Jacob has three sons, okay? And the whole book of Genesis is about all these sons and their, their bad histories. So, so, Joseph, uh, so Judah has three sons. So his oldest son, I forget his name right now, he, his oldest son marries Tamar, and see, it's really kind of fun that you don't remember the guy's name, but you do remember her name. It's kind of a Perez, switch on Perez it. and Zerah. No, those are the sons of Tamar. Judah, the father of Perez. Right. Uh, no. So, so Judah first had three sons by his wives, and then his oldest son marries Tamar. Well, Tamar is from the yeah, yeah. TV. What's that? She's on TV. Tamar, there's a, a reality show and one of the characters is named Tamar. Really? Uh -huh. I didn't know that. What's the name of the show? Uh, the Braxton. 
family huh. is Tony Braxton's sister. Oh. And that's why I remember it, Tamar. Oh. <laughs> well, actually, you know, Tamar is a biblical name, and she's a hero. And we're going to find she's a rather notorious hero, and we're going to find out why. So. And the name means palm tree. Really? It means what? Palm tree. Palm tree. Palm tree. Big palm tree. Oh, I didn't know there was something I forgot to. Oh, okay. That's that's really cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> so so Tamar is married to Judah's oldest son, and in the books of the in the, in the in the language of the book of Genesis, the Lord killed him because he was evil. It's like wow, you know, there's a lot of evil people in the Bible that God doesn't kill. Well, this guy's so evil, God kills him. All right. So the way the rules worked was that in order to preserve your line. The, your next brother was supposed to marry your widow and have children. Now, again, marriage was a very, was not necessarily a romantic institution, but a very practical institution. And so Tamar was supposed to marry, so Onan was supposed to sleep with Tamar, and this then becomes a very, another favorite, very famous story. Onan was supposed to sleep with Tamar, and Tamar was supposed to have children, and the children of Tamar were to be in the name of, of, Onan's older brother. And then Onan, um, Onan did something rather famous that, uh, that he is remembered now throughout the world for. Build his seed on the, Build his seed on the ground, which launched the word Onanism, <laughs> which is basically the withdrawal method. But, but what's so interesting about this is, I mean, Onan could have just been a jerk and said, I refuse to sleep with you. But what does he do? He's, he uses her. That's right, he uses her. He's kind of like, well, I kind of want to use you for my, for my sexual pleasure, but I'm not going to actually fulfill my obligations and responsibilities to you. Because this was actually a responsibility to Tamar. Because this was owed Tamar, because the idea was, well, who's going to, there's no social security. There's no 401, you know, 401k here. Who's going to take care of all of Tamar when she's an old woman? That's right. It's supposed to be the kids that you have. Tamar doesn't have any kids. Who's going to take care of her? Nobody. So while she's young, Onan's supposed to take care of her, have children, and then she'll have sons, and then her sons will take care of her, and the oldest son's line will continue. That's the way the program's supposed to work. Well, Onan, you know, he's having fun, but he keeps spilling his seed on the ground, and she's kind of like... Hey, hey, I know enough biology here to know this, this, you're not putting any money in my 401k here, man. So, okay. And so the Lord kills him. Really? That's right. Okay, now, yeah, these stories are amazing. And, and this is what Matthew's pointing us to. We're never even going to get out of Genesis. But anyway. <laughs> so then there's a third son. And Judah is no dummy. He's been paying attention. And he looks at this woman and says, this woman is bad luck. She's, she's, she's been with two of my sons, and they both ended up dead. So I'm not going to let my third son near this woman. And so he doesn't. Well, now what's Tamar going to do? She's the father. Well, she's facing a financial problem here because, again, she's got no 401k. She's got no future. So she knows the father, which is kind of implied in the story. So she dresses like a prostitute, hangs out by the side of the road. Judah comes around. You. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Judah comes around feeling a little randy. She's like, come over here, big fella. And 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 he says, you know, this is this is not in the day of, you know, well, if you're gonna go see a prostitute, I mean, do you take credit cards? Um, you know, I mean, I, I I don't have anything, I'm feeling a little randy, I don't have anything on me. I'll tell you what. I'll leave my, basically, some emblems that, that basically establishes identity. It's kind of like signing. I'll leave these here for you. And then, 
you know, when I get back home, you know, what are you going to tell the wife? I don't know. But when I get back home, I'll send a goat, because that's how he's going to pay for the, the trick with a goat. I'll send a goat, and you give my servant back the stuff, and, you know, transaction complete. Well, so they do the deed. Um, she keeps the stuff. Servant comes back with the goat. I can't find her. I can't find there was there wasn't you know over such and such a road you know where they hang out. I couldn't find her. Judas thinking, oh, hey, I got a freebie. Uh -oh. Word comes out, <laughs> nothing's free. That's right. Word comes out, Tamar's pregnant. Tamar's been praying the harlot. Now Judah. Wants to be all high and mighty. He's got a double standard. Because it's okay for him to be frequenting the prostitutes, but it's not okay for her to be playing the prostitute. So, where it gets to Judah, now Judah's all high and mighty and self-righteous. He says, bring her to me and we'll put her to death. So, they haul Tamar in. What does Tamar do? Canaan or Do these belong to anyone you know? <laughs> well, so then suddenly Judah, this becomes a turning point in Judah's life. And Judah now sees himself for who he is. He's not only capable of murder, he wants money on top of it. He wants to both frequent the prostitutes and condemn the women. He wants to be self-righteous, but he's a hypocrite. And so he says at that moment, Tamar is more worthy than I am. And now, well, then you think, okay, well, you know, he had a he had a conversion for that moment. Will it stick? Well, a little, a little bit later, when Joseph is in Egypt and the brothers go getting getting money, and Joseph now has some uh, has some that's right. Joseph has some power, and Joseph says, I think y'all are a bunch of spies, and I might just throw you in jail and kill you. Oh, no, 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 we're not spies. Well, how, how are you going to prove you're not spies? Well, somehow, to, you know, do, are these really all the brothers? No, there's Benjamin. Well, who's Benjamin? Well, you know, Joseph, you know, Joseph got killed. The brothers made a cover story, said the wild animals got him, and they killed a goat which again, in the Bible story, this, this just links through so many things. They, they killed a goat, put his blood, put the blood on, on, on Joseph's, you know, Joseph's garment. And so Jacob thinks his son is dead. And then Rachel has Benjamin. And if you think Jacob had an issue, you know, you think Jacob had issues with Joseph in terms of loving him? Oh, he doubled down on Benjamin. But this time the brothers couldn't hate Benjamin because they felt guilty about what they did to Joseph. So, so they're all trying to protect Benjamin. And, and then Joseph's like, well, you know, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep one of you locked up here unless you bring Benjamin back. So they go back and tell, they tell Jacob, uh, the guy in Egypt, yeah, he kept one of our, he kept one of us. And he's saying he's not going to spring him until he sees Benjamin. And that just tears Jacob up. Because then he's like, hey, I lost Joseph. Now one of my sons is in jail in Egypt, and you want to put Benjamin in play? And who steps up at that moment? Judah. Judah steps up and says, you know what? If Benjamin doesn't come back, you can kill me or my sons. Oh, Tamar changed Judah. Well, so it's very interesting that here Tamar is in the genealogy. And, and now we, we're getting, see, Matthew already in the genealogy is telling us something about Christ. He's telling us something about the truth. He's telling us something about the work of God in our hearts. So, um, yeah, Tamar. 
Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinadab, Abinadab the father of Nashon. I got these silly bars right now in my Bible that are okay. And on it goes um, Ram the son of the father of Abinadab, Abinadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz. Now, coffee break, I think, has been read, read Ruth this year, right? Last year. We did Ruth. In this class, Ruth, one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. Yes. Tiny little book. Amazing book. So now we're about to hit our... Um, ooh, is, oh, sorry. That's wrong. Boaz, um, whose mother was Rahab. Hmm. Well, chronologically that's interesting, but Rahab also brings up some interesting things. What do the, the most famous Rahab at the beginning of the book of, the book of Joshua... What does Rahab have in common with Tamar? Yeah, she's a prostitute too. Now remember when we were doing Ezekiel 16 and I talked about Gilgamesh? Yeah. And I talked about the civilizing of Enkidu? The, you know, the prostitute from, from Uruk came and made love with um, the wild man for six days and that civilized him. You can go back and we'll talk about that and we we'll talk about Ezekiel 16. Well, well, Rahab is a prostitute in, um, in Jericho, which is a critical place in terms of the all of these trade routes, a perpetually wealthy place, kind of like New Orleans, only it's, a, it's at a ford of the of you know it's at exactly the strategic place by the by the Jordan, and so as one preacher once told me, he said, "Yeah, um, the the the, um, the spies went into Jericho to get the lay of the land." <laughs> you don't get. I got the point. All right. <laughs> so. I'm there were spies. They're trying to understand. They're trying to spy out the land. They go to Rahab's house. Why are the, this has been a this has been a discussion forever in terms of um, Bible stuff? Because the spies, we want the spies from Israel to be what morally upright men. Well, <laughs> well, they stayed in the end, and so they, then there's that launches an entire conversation in biblical studies too. Was Ra did Rahab really sleep with men, or was she just an innkeeper, or was and, and the thing is, the difficulty is we don't have a lot of context in terms of culture and everything, so how to parse out the language is difficult. But generally speaking, Rahab's known as a prostitute. That kind of ties her in there with Tamar. She could have been mad. Well, that's right. It's like Miss Kitty and Gunsmoke, <laughs> right? You know. You got Marshall Dillon, and that's always kind of the funny thing about Gunsmoke. You got Marshall Dillon, and you got Miss Kitty, and you know, when you're a kid, you're watching it, you're just thinking, oh, that's Miss Kitty, and they have a bar and drinks and blah, blah, blah. You know, a little bit more about the West, and you kind of think, what profession is Miss Kitty in? <laughs> so, that's right, and she's kind of in the same profession as Rahab. But Rahab is famous for something. And it's not for, well, she's kind of famous for prostitution, but she's more famous for something else. Saving their life. That's right, how they respond. So, of course, word gets out that there's spies in the city of Jericho, and, well, you know, what are we, you know, if there's spies in the city, who's ever in charge of Jericho wants to go find them and kill them so that they can't spy? Um, Rahab hides them. And then Rahab, you know, you think this is a businesswoman. She's pretty sharp, as was Tamar. Um, what is she? She cuts a deal with the spies. What's the deal? You save me when you come and take down the city, and I'll get you out of here. That's right. Mm -hmm. And she she does what so that everyone can know not to go in and slaughter her and her family. Hangs out a cloth out of the window. Nothing like that. Yeah. yeah. And it's the, one of the things, if you read the Old Testament sometimes, in fact, the whole Bible, uh, but especially the Old Testament, pay attention to how few 
descriptions of color there are. Hardly any. But there's one here. Maury remembers. Maury's great with Bible detail. Come on, Maury. What's, what's, the, what's the sign for Rahab? The scarlet cord. Or the scarlet yeah. red cord. That's right. The red cord, the scarlet cord. A lot of preachers have used this over years to connect the red, obviously the color of blood, with the blood of Christ, the red on the doorpost from the lamb with the angel of death passing over. So hardly any, hardly any um, references to color in the Old Testament. And here's one. And you have hardly, it's kind of like you're watching the Old Testament in black and white. And, you know, you're watching this movie in black and white and suddenly there's color. Um, I think it was in Schindler's List that um, Spielberg used that technique in that movie. Um, so, and then Rahab is saved. So, second woman in the genealogy, we have Tamar and Rahab. And then we have Boaz. Well, Boaz, you know, Ruth, well, where was Ruth from? Moab. She was a Moabite. She's and 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 the women of Moab. If you read the Old Testament and you read the the story of of Israel coming into the land, the women of Moab have a notorious reputation, kind of like Tamar, because the the Israelites are coming into the land, and the men of Israel start doing what with the women of Moab? Well, they, uh, marriage is kind of a strong word. <laughs> but they, and, and this becomes a big incident. And, and then there's even some bloodshed that happens. And when we were, when I was, you know, so I've been preaching through the Old Testament at the 11 o'clock service. I mean, I remember hitting that passage in the book of Numbers, very famous passage. And so the women of Moab have kind of a bad reputation. And, and so a little that goes with Naomi into Moab because there's a famine in Bethlehem, and that's very mnemonic because Bethlehem means house of bread. There's no bread in the house of bread. Why not? Why has, why has God forgotten his people? And then they're over in Moab, and they have two sons, and they seem to be thriving in Moab, and his two, their two sons marry, and everything seems to be going great, and then disaster strikes. All the men die. Elimelech and her two sons all die. And now it's three widows. And, and again, widowhood is one of the worst catastrophes. Widowhood without children is one of the worst catastrophes that can happen to a woman in, you know, the ancient world there. And so Naomi is more than angry. She's bitter. And she's going to trot back to Bethlehem. And the two daughters say, oh, they do the dutiful thing. And they say, oh, we'll go with you to help take care of you because you don't have any sons. And Naomi says, no, stay here. You're still young. You can find a man. You can have a future. I'm going to go back to Bethlehem, try to sponge off the family if I can, and maybe not starve. But then Ruth does something different. What does Ruth do? That's right. She, she starts, she makes a vow in the Lord's name. And she says, you know, you know, only death will separate us. And then Naomi gives in. All right, come on. And Naomi's thinking, eh, I've got one mouth, I've got two mouths to feed now. Naomi's kind of an idiot because if there's anything we learn about Ruth, you know, when, when they get back to Bethlehem, Naomi seems to be sitting around the house watching soap operas. And Ruth's out there gleaning in the fields. It's like, you know, Naomi, <laughs> not, not terribly industrious. And of course, everything leads to Ruth meeting Boaz. Naomi then suddenly, well, she's not going to work in the fields, but she's watching soap operas. She knows how to match make. You know, okay, Ruth, this is how you catch a man. <laughs> and Boaz is a good one. <laughs> The guy's got lots of money. <laughs> was, wasn't Boaz um, related to Naomi? To Elimelech, that's right. Mm -hmm. And so Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. Right. 
But Boaz is also upright and righteous, and, and the story is perfectly told so that, I mean, there's all these subtle ways that the stories get told. One of the subtle ways, you know, why, why does Boaz want Ruth? Because he's a horny old man, and she's a young, hot thing. No. And we know that because there's a kinsman redeemer closer. And Boaz basically says, I'm not going to sleep with you, Ruth. I'm going to do this the right way. I first have to talk to the other guy. But Boaz is also shrewd. So he goes to the other guy and says, yeah, you've heard about Ruth, that, you know, Moabite hottie? She's in town. And, um, and, ah, oh, you know, everybody's, hey, everybody's looking at Ruth, fresh blood, you know, hey. But then Moabaz, Mo, Boaz springs it and says, yeah, but the minute you sleep with her, now this gets back again to Tamar and Onan. The minute you sleep with her, you basically assume a Limelex line, which means that any children you have with Ruth might contend with your sons for your inheritance. And that guy who's left nameless for his own protection um, says, ah, I don't want to touch her. And then Boaz, of course, marries Ruth and they have Obed. And the end of the book of Ruth ends with little Obed bumping out, you know, on Naomi's, on Naomi's lap. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone has a future because this Moabite girl was more righteous than the daughter of Israel. Mm -hmm. But God redeems them all. Mm -hmm. What a book! What an amazing story! So, what a happy ending! Just four little chapters. All of that gets poured into there. Some of the best books in the Old Testament are the small books, like Jonah. Amazing book. Four little chapters. So Rahab gets into the gets into the uh, gets into the story. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. And then we go through. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been. Uriah's wife. And again, Matthew was just, I mean, he could have just said, David, the father of Solomon. He could have said, David, the father of Solomon, mother of Bathsheba. But David, King David, the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. He points out in the genealogy that David set up the political murder of Uriah so he could cover up his adultery with Bathsheba. So, you know, even the way Matthew says it, I mean, these Gospels are not... Every, everyone assumes that the Gospel writers are going to be pieces of propaganda. And Matthew is, is saying... Hey, we're going to have full disclosure here, baby. These are in the line of Jesus, and this is important. Because this tells you exactly who Jesus came for. Jesus came for murderers, and even greedy, people who prefer greed over murder. They came for, Jesus came for prostitutes, or people who play the prostitute. Jesus came for foreigners, who show themselves more righteous than the children of Israel. These are all... Now again, why begin with a genealogy? Matthew is saying, these are all in the story of Jesus. And this will all come to play in the story of Jesus. Now, we're just about out of time, so we didn't even get through the genealogy. But what does this say about God and his plan?
because, you know, we're all catching up. We're all always catching up. Because none of us can know and see everything. So God is very polite that way and says, okay, a little review for those of you just getting up to speed today. Yeah, because a lot of people do start with the New Testament when they're starting out reading the Bible. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And they start out with the New Testament and they start in they start in um, they start in Matthew and son of a gun, there's a genealogy. Ooh. <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be an interesting book. Go ahead, Mark. No, just a question. Uh, what about uh, Luke has a different genealogy to start? Do you have time to explain briefly what that is? Or? Well, there are a lot of theories. Well, there's a few interesting differences between Luke's and Matthew's genealogy. Luke's genealogy starts with Adam. Matthew's genealogy starts with Abraham. And now, neither Abraham, neither Matthew nor Luke explain the differences, but there's been a lot of postulating between them. One of them is Luke um, writes, his target audience is the Gentiles. Um, anybody, Luke, Luke is someone who we know a fair amount about. Luke was um, part of Paul's contingent. And so Luke um, grew up he proud, you know, could very well have been someone of Jewish ancestry who grew up in the Roman Empire. And so when he starts with Adam, he wants to, by that way, kind of include the Gentiles in the story right from the start. Yeah, but he's got a different father for Joseph, too. Yeah. Or a different name, right? Yeah. Different and then, so if you line up those genealogies, boy, you can have a lot of fun trying to figure this out. A lot of ink has been spilled working on it. Uh, Matthew um, is writing to the Jews, and so he starts with Abraham. Some also say Matthew gives us the genealogy of Joseph, yeah. who would be Jesus' legal father, Mary's husband. Mary's husband, whereas Luke gives us a genealogy of Mary. That's another theory that, that has gone on about this, mm -hmm. who is Jesus' biological mother. Okay, and there are lots more differences in them. And you know, Lily asked about Lily asked about commentaries. These are the kinds of things in commentaries, and there's probably even a note in your study Bible about these two genealogies. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Maury. Did you have any other observations on that? No, I just wondered if there might have been Greek translations of the names. That's not the explanation. Though. Names, names in the Bible are both a source of vital information and perpetual woes for detailed scholars. Because, I mean, part of... They skip. They skip. Uh, people have multiple names. Um, I mean, when I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic, everyone seemed to have at least three names. There was, especially people I work with, there, were, there was their Haitian name, there was their Dominican name in Spanish, and then there was often even another nickname. And so someone would be talking about someone, and I'd say, who? <laughs> oh, that's so-and-so. Oh, well, why didn't you use that name? Ah, you know. It's like, reading a, it's like reading a Russian novel. If you ever read a Russian novel, they, they, everybody's got at least two names because they all also use the, the patronomic system. And so, and, and when it comes to biblical names, it's even more murky because, so, so this English Bible that you have in front of you, um, that's the product of a ton of scholarship. But there are lots of, especially the Old Testament, there are lots of, um, there's the, um, often we call the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew, and then there's the Targum, which is the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament, because again, in Judea was part of the Persian Empire, and Aramaic was part of that was the language of that empire. And then there's the, what's called the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, but here's the thing. So most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Okay? And so we, we assume there's those scrolls get very, very ancient indeed. Far ancient than the scrolls we actually have. 
At some point, someone took a scroll written in Hebrew and translated it into Aramaic. Well, as things keep going through time, details change. So part of the re reason scholars read, let's say, the Targum, uh, then there's, of course, the Arabic translations, and you know, translations keep going. Some of the reasons sometimes people read the Targum or the, the Septuagint is because even if, let's say, this is the earliest scrolls we have in Hebrew, we know there were more ancient scrolls, and some of those ideas probably got into the other translations because we know these translations are more ancient than the copies of the scrolls we have now. So we study these translations in order to maybe try and guess, and all we can do is guess, guess what were in these more ancient scrolls. And so when Maury asks about names, well, one of, the, one of the toughest things to deal with in translations is names. And so, I mean, when I was growing up, there's Saul and there's Paul. When I was growing up, because of the way the book of Acts is written, I always thought Saul was Paul's name before he was a Christian, and Paul was Saul's name after he was a Christian. Saul is Hebrew, Paul is Greek. Soy Pablo in Spanish, I'm Paul in English. So once you get into names and this kind of thing, oh boy. <laughs> because names are sometimes translated and sometimes not. So it's Saul is Hebrew. Think about King Saul. Paul is named after King Saul. And Paul is Greek. Pablo and Pablo is Spanish. So, <laughs> so it's, that's a great question, Maury. And, it, and, and so now when we open our English Bible, it's like, well, the, the, the meal has been cooked for you. But when you get into all this stuff, you're getting into the butcher shop. <laughs> you're getting to where the sausage is made. And, and it doesn't mean it's just all relative or, or nonsense. You know, it's it's real, but it's complicated. So, there's that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the time we've had together. And we pray, Lord, that you would um, use what we learn and, and help us, Lord, to, to use it in our lives. And may your spirit work through it and um, do its work in our hearts. So hear our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, well, wait a while. You want a week off or you want to have class? I'll just assume we have class. All right, let's have class. I mean, because if nobody's going to be here, we won't have class. But if y'all are going to be here, let's have class. Sure. I'm not going anywhere. All right. And I know of.